We uh, <coughs> left off talking about the six minute right to trial by one Pierce. Uh, the uh, right to a speedy trial. You have these four things that you consider for the speedy trial. The uh, how long was the delay? How long was the delay? The reason for the delay. Was the defendant prejudiced by the delay? And um, did, the, did the defendant seek a speedy trial? Uh, then we came to the assistance of counsel, and what we're talking about here was the assistance of counsel as it comes under the fifth, under the sixth amendment. The other one that I couldn't think of here just before the break is the right to a public trial. And at the end of the break, we were right here talking about the fifth amendment. And we were saying that there are two aspects to this Fifth Amendment right, to the Miranda right. And the, uh, the Miranda, I'll put it over here. Miranda is required by the Fifth Amendment. And there are two important rights under Miranda on the board. That would be uh, right here, right over here at this branch right here. Two rights. One is the right to remain silent. <coughs> and the other is the right to <coughs> right to a counsel, right to a lawyer. And the Miranda rights include both of these. But the, when the defendant asserts the right, they can assert one and not the other. The person says, I don't want to talk to you, that's, remaining, that's asserting the right to remain silent. And the person says, I uh, want to see my lawyer, that's this one. If the person says, I don't want to talk to you, then the police are permitted to come back at a later time and say to the person, well, we've waited a respectable time, do you want to talk to us now? The person says, no, I still don't want to talk to you. Please can come back again and again, as long as they're not harassing the person, they can keep coming back and uh, ask the person, do you want to talk to us now? If they assert their right to remain silent. Okay. But if they assert their right to a lawyer, right to counsel, then the rule is different. The police cannot come back and ask the person anything else until a lawyer is there. And when you look at these bar questions, you'll often see a question where the person has asserted the right to remain silent but did not assert their right to counsel. So watch for that, please. <clears throat> if the person asserts their right to remain to a lawyer, the police must not ask any more questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> must not ask any more questions about the case until they get the lawyer there. Uh, now, if the person just wants to volunteer before the lawyer shows up, they can go to the police and say, Hi, police, I'd like to confess, please. The police don't have to say, well, no, no, you can't confess, wait till your lawyer's here. They can say, sure, we'll listen to you. And if the person initiates the confession and starts giving a confession, the police can then ask for more details about it. The person said, I killed him, I killed him with four shotguns and two butcher knives, and I buried the body. And now the police say, well, where is the dead body? Well, the police can ask that because the defendant initiated the confession, they initiated the, uh, the conversation uh, which included the confession. But the police cannot initially ask that if they ask for their lawyer. Uh, that's the Fifth Amendment right here. Now, next under the Sixth Amendment, assistance of counsel, the, sixth, the Fifth Amendment, this right to uh, the Miranda rights, they end, the Miranda rights end when the person appears uh, at the, uh, when the person appears uh, before uh, the court for the first time. When the person first appears at the court, the Miranda rights end. They don't exist anymore. And that is the instant where the Sixth Amendment rights begin, right here. Now, uh, if, the, uh, if the facts tell you that the person is asserting a Sixth Amendment right, when they haven't even been to court yet, 
when the court processes have not been turned on, there is no Sixth Amendment right. So a person will search the Sixth Amendment right when they first get arrested. The person gets arrested on the street and uh, they ask the court person questions and they didn't uh, have their lawyer. There is no Sixth Amendment right. So you cannot violate the Sixth Amendment right until this first court proceeding. At that first court proceeding right here, the person is entitled to the assistance of counsel. That's the Sixth Amendment. Now, at this, when the Sixth Amendment right begins, when the Sixth Amendment right begins, the person is entitled, we'll put it right here, when the Sixth Amendment right begins, I'll put it up here for lack of a better place right here. I'll put it here. When the Sixth Amendment right begins, the person is entitled to the assistance of counsel at all critical stages of the proceeding. Okay? All critical stages of the proceeding are entitled to the assistance of counsel. Now, uh, of course, all critical stages, and of course the question becomes, what is a critical stage? Well, certainly an interrogation is a critical stage. Certainly a lineup is a critical stage. Now, mind you, if the lineup occurs before the person has been to court, they don't have a Sixth Amendment right to counsel at that critical stage. And they don't have a Miranda right either at that stage because Miranda uh, says you have a right to remain silent, you have a right to remain silent, but you don't have a right to lawyer just at the lineup. Okay? Uh, and so the Sixth Amendment Miranda rights don't give you a right to a lawyer at the lineup. So if the police arrest someone and they do or don't give them a Miranda warning, it doesn't matter. And they have a lineup, it does not violate the Fifth Amendment to have a lineup without the lawyer if they haven't been to court yet. But if they have been to court, Fifth Amendment's over, Sixth Amendment again, they have a right to lawyer at the lineup because that's a critical phase. Finally, under the Sixth Amendment comes the right to a public trial. The right to a public trial belongs to the defendant normally. The Sixth Amendment says right, the defendant has a right to a public trial. Now, this right to a public trial means that the defendant has a right to a public trial at, at the trial proceeding itself, the trial, at the jury selection, all that stuff leading up to the trial, even at the preliminary hearing, even at suppression hearings. However, however, the court can under the right circumstances, not have a public trial at, for example, a suppression hearing if an undercover police officer is going to testify at the suppression hearing. They don't want to disclose the identity. So if the court's got a good enough reason, and uh, then the, they can close uh, that part of the trial to the public. But without that, they really can't do it. The public, the, the defendant has, this is a defendant's right to a public trial, but the court has held that the public at large, every member of the public, has a right to know about governmental proceedings, except, of course, you know, very confidential ones of some sort. But these are important governmental proceedings, and people have, when the government is prosecuting somebody and is about to take their liberty or maybe even their life away from them, that uh, the government, the individual, the public, has a right to know what the government is doing. This is a government of and by the people and all that stuff. And so uh, the public has a First Amendment right to attend these trials. Not a Sixth Amendment. The defendant has a Sixth Amendment right. The public has a First Amendment right to be there. So that's how it works. Now, uh, we were uh, going through this uh, text on a question and uh, in the question, we were now at line 29. And at line 29 says, Sally's statement, she, uh, uh, Donna wants to suppress a bunch of stuff. She wants to suppress Sally's statement to Tech, which Donna claims, A, is hearsay, well it is, and the admission of which would violate her rights under the Sixth Amendment. Well, that's how we got to talking about the Sixth Amendment. And the Sixth Amendment has uh, these rights uh, in it, and uh, the uh, other right that I kept forgetting here 
under the six minutes of the confrontation clause. We finally got them all. The confrontation clause. Now, the confrontation clause uh, says that you have the right to confront witnesses against you. So somebody's going to accuse you, they got to come to trial and take the stand so you can cross-examine and say, you know, you say you identified me uh, at the hearing, well, how far away were you? I mean, at, at the robbery, how far away were you? Do you wear glasses? Did you have them on? You know, and so forth. So if someone's going to accuse you of a crime, you should have a right to confront that person at the trial proceeding. Now, so uh, that's what the Confrontation Clause has to say. Here, uh, Sally is the person accusing. Sally is saying, Donna told me, and yet uh, Sally isn't there. Sally is not there. Uh, now, if Sally were there, uh, Sally could say, Donna told me, hearsay, admissions exception to the hearsay rule, Donna gets to cross-examine Sally, say, you say I told you exactly what did I say, where, would, where did this happen, when did it happen, and so forth. So Donna could cross-examine Sally. Well, she can't. So uh, Donna is saying that Sally's testimony is hearsay and it violates the Sixth Amendment. Well, it violates this part of the Sixth Amendment, the Confrontation Clause. It doesn't violate any of these other parts, but it does violate the Confrontation Clause. Item D, at line 31. Uh, Donna says Sally's uh, statement was obtained in violation of Sally's rights under the Fourth Amendment. Well, Sally's rights under the Fourth Amendment. Let's take a look at those. The Fourth Amendment. Well, the Fourth Amendment uh, prohibits unreasonable searches or seizures. If you want to search or seize, get a warrant. They didn't get a warrant. Uh, and indeed, they seized Sally without a warrant, and they got statements from her. And those statements are not admissible against Sally. But against Donna, she does not have the standing, and so that won't work. Line 34. The fingerprints she provided which Donna claims were obtained in violation of her rights under the Fifth Amendment were the fruits of an unlawful search and seizure. Well, uh, the Fifth Amendment uh, prohibits compelled testimony, and the fingerprints and passport are not testimony, and so it did not violate the Fifth Amendment against compelled testimony. And she says it was the fruits of an unlawful search and seizure. Well, the police didn't. Uh, search or seize uh, her, they seized her passport, and they, they seized her fingerprints, but that's not an unlawful search. And furthermore, the, the state can require that the person show up and produce their fingerprints and photographs and documents and that sort of thing. Nothing unlawful about that. The requiring the person to produce these kinds of documents does not violate the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment prohibits compelled testimony and these documents are not testimony. Item 3, line 38, Donna's passport. I'm sorry, we're talking, item 2 was about her fingerprints, and item 3 is about the passport, and we, we covered them both. Neither one of those constitutes testimony, and the Fifth Amendment prohibits compelled testimony. And then they ask you, what should the prosecution argue in opposition? And how should the court rule? And that takes care of this question with Donna and Peck. Now, let's next go to uh, the question from the February 2004 bar. February 2004 is uh, the question with Bank and Dave. And once again, Let's go through the events as they occurred, talk about the law, 
and then answer the question. What? Again, let me remind you that you answer the questions according to how they're asked. So what we're doing for teaching purposes is as we go through each time some event occurs, we talk about the law and application of law as raised by those events. But do not answer a bar question by going by saying, fact one says so-and-so, let me tell you about fact one. Fact two says so-and-so, let me tell you about fact two. And fact three says so-and-so, let me tell you about fact three, and so forth. So please do not do that. Uh, line six. Uh, bank was robbed at 1 p.m. by a man who brandished a shotgun and spoke with a distinctive accent. The teller gave the robber packets of marked money, which the robber put into a briefcase. Okay. Background, police haven't done anything yet. Remember that it is the police who, uh, we're outside the court system, we're looking at the, uh, the uh, police conduct. Only the police can violate, only the state can violate the Constitution in a criminal law problem that state acts as usual police, be sure to point out to the bar examiners that when the police are doing something, that, that is the government acting, and then that the, uh, they, the only the government can violate the Constitution and then work their way down uh, the Constitution. That part of the Constitution usually gets applied to the state through the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Now you've got that part of the Constitution applying to that police officer's conduct. Be sure to put that trace in there. If you don't put that trace in there, the bar exam will take points away from you. Continuing, line 7, at the end of line 7. At 3.30 p.m., the police received a telephone call from an anonymous caller who described a man standing at a particular corner in the downtown business district and said the man was carrying a sawed-off shotgun in a briefcase. I'm not quite sure how you see the sawed-off shotgun in a briefcase, but maybe it got opened at some point and the person saw it. We don't know. So you can see how it makes this anonymous telephone caller a little bit suspicious because the information which they gave, we're not quite sure how uh, you can get that information. So be suspicious, but continue. So the anonymous caller came in. Now, of course, uh, the police are going to use that anonymous caller for a probable cause. And um, the, to establish probable cause, the police must have, um, uh, they must have, under the totality of the circumstances, they must have, uh, they must believe that more likely than not, the person to be found or the items to be seized will be found at that particular location. Uh, there's an older case called Illinois versus Gates in which the police supposedly got an anonymous tip saying that uh, a man was driving back from Florida with drugs in the trunk of his car. And they gave some details about where the drug transaction was going to take place at a particular motel in Florida that the person would buy the drugs there, they would put them in the trunk of the car, it would happen on a certain date, and the person would be driving back to Illinois. So when, on the, when the police arrested this person, when he got back to Illinois, the police said, we had this anonymous tip that said all this was going to happen. Well, the anonymous tip, uh, you know, is suspicious. But if the anonymous tip gives information about something that's going to happen in the future. If it's going to happen in the future, that helps to give some reliability because when those things begin to happen, that adds reliability to the anonymous tip. But if you get an anonymous tip and you don't have anything like that that kind of verifies it, then that's a very suspicious anonymous tip. Now, people, the, the courts assume I mean, let's back up a second. This, uh, the probable cause to, to getting it from uh, some source, you need to have two things. 
you need to have a reliable source from which you're getting the information and the uh, the source that is providing it needs now not only does, does that person need to be reliable but they must, must have gotten it in some kind of a believable or reliable way the information they got they acquired it in some way that seems reliable or reasonable but the courts in Illinois versus Gates G-A-T-E-S said that uh, you don't separately have to have the preponderance of evidence on each of those that it's really the totality of the circumstances to make up the reliability of the anonymous tip and if you can believe more likely than not that the, that the anonymous that there's that it's likely that what the person is tipped about is going to be true that's a reliable anonymous tip and you, you can, whatever you're missing in terms of the reliability of the informant maybe you don't know anything about the informant because it came in on a strange tel telephone line but the informant gives you all kinds of information about what's going to happen these people are going to meet at the train station one of them is going to be wearing a black suit the other one is going to have a red rose in the lapel he's going to be carrying a brown brief briefcase the drugs are in the briefcase they're going to meet somebody who's wearing a white suit and they're going to have a top hat on and some blue shoes and you say I'm going on to be ridiculous here but the point is that if this a total this caller is totally anonymous and they give all that kind of information and the police go to the train station and they watch all this happen that's reliable enough in this case you have a person who says a man is carrying a shotgun and a briefcase and uh, we don't know how they got the information and the tipper we don't know if they're reliable have they given reliable information before not really and so we're not so sure that this information is sufficiently reliable so be sure to challenge that generally speaking citizens and in, citizen informants are presumed to be reliable because the citizen has no interest one way or another in the outcome so they are presumed to be in, uh, reliable uh, but you still need if it's an anonymous tipper you need something a little more we don't have much here so be sure to challenge that and say that this may not be a uh, the police may not have sufficient probable cause but let's go ahead within minutes a police officer who had been informed about the robbery and the telephone call observed Dave holding a briefcase at that location they put the description given by the anonymous caller well uh, do you have enough argue the point point out that uh, in these tip cases that the police need a reliable source citizen informants are presumed to be reliable they need a, and the person needs to have gotten the information in a reliable way but that if either one of these branches is very strong you can make for a week and the other one and here uh, the police the, the person who gave the description of the person who was uh, carrying this I don't know if there's enough or not you know, just describe, I won't go through the facts again but make an argument that you may or may not have sufficient probable cause here next paragraph the officer approached Dave with a service revolver drawn and drawn and pointed at the ground he explained the reason for his approach he handcuffed Dave and opened the briefcase doesn't say he just says the officer but does say he explains as a male officer handcuffed Dave and opened the briefcase now was that okay is this a lawful arrest or not answer make the argument we just talked about if this is a lawful arrest if this is a lawful arrest the police are not only arresting this person based hopefully on probable cause but they are also searching the briefcase is that a lawful search if you want a lawful search what do you do get a warrant did the police get a warrant no they have to prove an exception with a preponderance of the evidence which exception are they going to try to prove they're going to try to prove this one. that it was uh, incident they'll, they'll claim that the police searched the briefcase 
based on this expression. Incidental loss will rest, since the rest is lost. They might also claim this expression. Probable cause and no time to get a warrant. Continuing. Open the briefcase, line 16. The briefcase at line 17, line 16, contained only the marked money taken in the bank robbery. Well, it contained the marked money. Would the police officer know that this is marked money? Because if the teller handed it to him, it looks probably like ordinary money. It's not going to have yellow marks on each of the dollar bills. Uh, and so how is the officer going to know that this is marked money? But somebody who's standing on the street corner with a briefcase with a lot of money in there, the bank just got robbed a little while ago, I mean, that's probably enough. You don't even have to know the money is marked. So if the police officer had to justify the search based on this or this, then once they open the briefcase, they see there's money in there. Now there's probable cause, there's even more probable cause, to believe that this person is the bank robber. But you had enough, hopefully, to begin with. If you didn't have enough to begin with, they shouldn't have stopped it. Uh, the, we now have line 17, line 16. The officer said to Dave, now watch it here, when the officer starts speaking to the defendant, you now have the possibility of some, what, this stuff right here, interrogation. If you're going to interrogate people, there's no Sixth Amendment right yet because the person has not been taken before a magistrate, hasn't gone to court. There's Miranda, uh, and uh, there's Miranda rights and there's due process. Due process, you cannot use uh, unduly coercive means in torturing people. You can't use that. But the police officer is talking to this person. Um, he's got a gun drawn. The person's handcuffed. Is that unduly coercive? Probably not. Uh, you can't just say that. They'll give a reason. You know, the person's uh, statements are statements by uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the interrogation. You know, it must not, be, pardon, any statement by a defendant must be the free and rational choice of the defendant under the totality of the circumstances. That's the rule for uh, due process. In other words, if someone, if you get a statement from someone, was that statement involuntary or voluntary? If it's involuntary, it violates due process. You point a gun at someone and say, tell me what I want to hear, I'm going to blow your brains out, that is clearly involuntary. You put them on the rack and you start tightening the rack and pouring hot oil on them and say, hurry up and confess or I can stop, that's involuntary. But you don't have to get that extreme for a statement to be involuntary. You need to know the factors that make up involuntary and it's a whole lot less than that. The statements which make up an involuntary statement you can find several places. I'll give you some factors here that you can find in your uh, and your three-ring binder, tell you a page where you can find these factors. Uh, in your three-ring binder, under uh, criminal uh, procedure, under criminal law and procedure, one of the questions has a whole list of factors which um, help you decide. I want you to see this list because it's useful. Uh, there's several places, but one place you can find it is under a question from the February 1980 bar. February 1980. I think that's still in your binder. And if you don't have it in the uh, February 1980 bar, uh, you can also find it in uh, another place. I'll tell you here in just a second. February 1980. Uh, I want you to see 
see the slip because I don't have time to put the whole list on the board, so I'll tell you where you can find it. Um, you also can find it the July 79 question, July 79 question on the second page of that question, and the February 1980 on the first page of that question. You will see a list of factors there um, which you can use to help decide whether or not a statement was voluntary or not. Let me read them here to you, just uh, so we can talk about them in a second. It says, a, a statement, uh, an out-of-court statement, will be suppressed if it was involuntary and therefore in violation of due process. How do you decide whether or not a statement was involuntary? And remember that the rule is that the statement must be voluntary. And the defendant doesn't have to prove that they beat me up to get the statement. He doesn't have to prove it was involuntary. What the defendant has to do is to make a credible claim that the statement was involuntary. That's all. A credible claim that it was involuntary. And then the burden shifts to the state to prove the statement was voluntary. And what factors do you take into account in deciding whether or not the statement was voluntary? Rule. The statement must be voluntary, which means the, the, uh, the, the court, to quote the Supreme Court, the statement must be the, quote, free and rational choice of the defendant under the totality of the circumstances. Quote, free and rational choice of the defendant under the totality of the circumstances. That's what's required. And the state has to prove it. What factors might the state take into account? Well, I have 11 factors listed here from various cases in both of those locations I told you about. One of them says the factors are the defendant's age. You can see how the pressure you put on a child versus a seasoned criminal adult defendant would be different. Age, intelligence of the defendant, experience with the criminal justice system. I'm going to go through these quickly because you can look them up in your book there. The appeal to friendship, long incommunicado detention, lack of food or sleep, violation of Miranda, or any other constitutional right goes into this overall decision of voluntariness. Promises of leniency which the police cannot grant. Trickery, even threats of disbarment have been used. And so, if the defendant claims that the statement was uh, involuntary, just using all these kinds of factors, the government has to prove that the statement was voluntary, which means the government has to prove that the statement was a free and rational choice for the defendant under the totality of the circumstances. Now, getting back to our problem, um, in uh, our problem, we have the police standing there with a person uh, with a briefcase open, gun drawn. I don't know if the gun is still drawn there or not, but you can see how you might have, uh, and the person made a statement. And uh, it says, the officer said today, this is line 16, line 16, the officer said today, I know you're the one who robbed the bank. Where's the shotgun? Okay, so now you clearly have interrogation. You have interrogation. We had an arrest. We got that right here. Didn't have a warrant. But it's the arrest of a person. You don't need a warrant to arrest a person if the people, police have the probable cause because people can walk away so easily. After the person was arrested, the police searched incidental lawful arrest or a probable cause with exigent circumstances. Let me talk a little bit more about this search here. Um, 
this one right here, incidental lawful arrest. A couple of details I want to give you about this incidental lawful arrest. Uh, what about the case where the people, where the police arrest somebody and they arrest the person at home and the person is sitting on the couch at home? So the police make the arrest. Now, we all agree that when the police make the arrest uh, while the person is sitting on a couch, uh, that the police can pat the person down to see if they're carrying a weapon. Everybody agrees to that. Common sense. Can the police look in the vicinity immediately around the person? Can they search that? If the person is sitting on the couch and there's a coffee table with a drawer right in front of the couch, can the police open that drawer? Can they look under the cushion of the couch? Can they look under the couch? Can they look behind the couch? How far can the police go when they're searching in the immediate vicinity? And we all know the rule, the so-called arm wingspan rule, which says the police can search in the immediate vicinity of the wingspan of the person, the places where the person could have reached to obtain a weapon or to, uh, or to conceal evidence, where they could have reached to obtain evidence or to conceal, uh, to obtain a weapon or conceal evidence. That's the wingspan. Here, the briefcase would qualify as the wingspan. But the police, if the police are, is trying, trying to prevent himself from getting killed, he doesn't really need to search the briefcase. The police can just take the briefcase. A woman is arrested in the street with a purse, and the police are worried about getting killed. All they have to do is take the purse. They don't have to search the purse. If the person has an envelope, do they need to open the envelope? No, they take the purse, take the briefcase. And so this is a search incident to a lawful arrest. Search uh, that they, they can take the they can seize the briefcase, but can they open it and search it incident to a lawful arrest? Well, the argument can be made if the briefcase, for example, was locked, then uh, they don't need to break it open because the person couldn't have reached in there to get a weapon or conceal evidence anyway. And so what's the justification for searching the briefcase as opposed to just seizing the briefcase? And here you might argue, well, we can certainly seize it incident to lawful arrest, but you could use the inevitable discovery rule, the inevitable discovery rule right here. You say, well, if the person is arrested and taken off to jail, that the police, uh, what are they going to do with the briefcase? Well, they can inventory the whole briefcase itself if it's locked. And say, we are taking care of this briefcase because we see that, excuse me, from the person who was arrested. So, excuse me. But if so the police can seize the briefcase, but opening it to search inside, that's a little different. And so the police can say, well, since the briefcase was unlocked, and if we're going to inventory it <coughs> for security purposes, to make sure the stuff wasn't lost or stolen, we're going to inventory the contents of the briefcase, then uh, if we discover something in the course of inventorying it, it's feasible, it's admissible, if it's a lawful inventory search. So they would have inevitably discovered the, uh, the contents of the briefcase. So that's one argument you can make for searching the briefcase. Now, the, uh, uh, um, you but if the briefcase was locked and the police seized it, now they probably need to get a warrant to go inside the briefcase because you don't have the inevitable discovery rule. So, inevitable discovery gets them to search the briefcase. But let's go back to the point we were making about incident to lawful arrest. So the person is arrested on the couch. The police can search wingspan behind the couch, in front of the couch, under the couch, all that sort of stuff. And that all of that kind of search is considered to be incident to a lawful arrest. 
Now, what about the case where the person is arrested in a car? In that case, certainly again, the police can search, <coughs> excuse me, they can search uh, the person being arrested, <coughs> excuse me, they can search the person being arrested, the pockets and such things, because you can't let them take that stuff to jail. But what about the inside of the car? Can they search the inside of the car? The way they could have searched under the couch, below the couch, in front of the couch, and so forth. And the answer is that the current law under New York versus Belton, B-E-L-T-O-N, is that yes, the police can search the entire passenger compartment of the car. The entire passenger compartment of the car incident to lawful arrest. Now, if you use the arms span reach rule, you get kind of a problem because if you arrest a midget who is driving a limousine, then the midget could say, there's no way I could reach into the, that far into the back seat part of the limousine. Um, if you arrest a basketball player who is driving a little MG sports car, they can reach around and underneath the car without even getting out of the car. And so if you use the arms span reach, you end up with this funny rule that depends on the height of the person and the size of the car and all that. So the Supreme Court, fortunately, came through with this wonderful rule saying we'll solve the problem that you can search the entire passenger compartment of the car. Okay, that includes the glove compartment, under the rugs of the car, back seat of the car. If there's a coat in the back seat, you can look in the pockets of the coat. If the back seat pocket coat has got a zipper bag, you can open the zipper bag. All that sort of stuff you can do. Now, for something that's locked, uh, you're probably going to have to get a warrant unless you can make out probable cause plus exigent circumstances. Otherwise, you can search all that stuff. Incident to lawful arrest. So, We've got this cop standing on the corner, gun drawn, arrested the person, seized the briefcase, incident to lawful arrest, uh, opened the briefcase, you can justify that under the inevitable discovery rule, and now sees the money, uh, and uh, sees the money, and now the police says to Dave. Now the police officer is going to say to Dave, you immediately have possibility of some interrogation here. Is that interrogation lawful? Sixth Amendment does not apply yet. Miranda does apply. It did not give the person Miranda warning. And uh, so, and also due process applies. You know, was this person so threatened by the police officer standing there who might still have a gun in his hand that the person felt coerced to make the statement? So was the violate due process? I don't think so, but the fact is the ones that we just talked about, and I don't, uh, uh, I don't think it must be a free and rational choice under the totality of the circumstances. Now the police did ask a question: Where is the, where is the gun, the shotgun? That is interrogation. You have to give the rule. What is interrogation? and show that that's interrogation. Rule. Interrogation is any word or conduct by the police which they know or, has, know or should know is likely to elicit an incriminating response. Once again, interrogation. We're defining interrogation right here. Interrogation is any word or conduct by the police which they know or should know is likely to elicit an incriminating response. Here, where is the shotgun? Well, what do you expect how to say? You're asking for an incriminating response. And so, uh, the, uh, in fact, the police here said, uh, I know you are the one who robbed the bank. Where is the shotgun? Give the rule show and conclude that's interrogation. It's interrogation without Miranda. Because we didn't give the Miranda warning. Any statements made in response to interrogation about Miranda are suppressed. But there are a few exceptions to Miranda. 
one of the exceptions to Miranda is the uh, public safety exception. Now, the public safety exception to Miranda, public safety to exception to Miranda, uh, was first uh, announced in a case called New York versus Quarles, Q U A R L E S. In New York versus Quarles, the police were uh, pursuing a person who was wanted for rape. And uh, this person ran into a grocery store. The police pursued him into the grocery store, finally caught up with him in the grocery store, and arrested him. When they arrested him, they found the person had a shoulder holster for a pistol, but there was no pistol in the shoulder holster. And the police immediately said, without any Miranda warnings, where is the pistol? Well, that's interrogation. There was no Miranda. The court said, it's okay, public safety. Public safety because some child in the grocery store might very well, said the person's answer, by the way, was the gun's over there in the milk carton. Well, some child playing in the grocery store might have seen the gun, not knowing it was a real gun, started playing with it, and there you have a public safety problem. So the court said, in the interest of the public safety, this is an exception to Miranda. Well, we've got the same thing here. Where is the shotgun? And it's just like quarrels. And that's the answer you should have given here, that Miranda wasn't satisfied, but we have a public safety exception. And the person uh, uh, statement was an admission The, uh, they pointed to a nearby trash container in which they concealed shot, in which he had concealed the shotgun and said, I knew all along I'd be caught. Well, when he pointed to it, that's like answering. And he says, I knew I'd be caught. Okay, well, that's a confession. So we have, he points to the shotgun and confesses. It's a full confession. An admission is admitting some aspect of the crime, something that's contrary to what the person says at court. When they get to court, if they anything they said contrary to the position they take at trial, that's an admission made outside of trial. But a confession is acknowledging all the elements of the crime. And this person saying, I knew I'd be caught, that's probably an admission, it's probably a full, full-blown confession. Now, uh, the reason we distinguish between admissions and confessions is because sometimes an admission can be harmless. In other words, there's so much other evidence about the same point that, and maybe it was a minor point anyway, that it's a mere admission, not a confession. And you can't have an admission which is harmless error because on appeal, prosecution can say, we didn't even need that, we didn't even need that piece of evidence. But if it's a full-blown confession, the court has held there's no such thing as a harmless confession. That's why we distinguish between. So this was a full-blown confession <coughs> taken not in violation of Miranda because they have a public safety exception. Next paragraph, line 20. <coughs> Excuse me. Dan was charged with robbery. Well, we can understand why. He has chosen not to testify at trial, that's fine. He has, however, moved to be allowed to read aloud a newspaper article to be selected by the judge without being sworn as a witness or subject to cross-examination in order to demonstrate that he has no accent. Well, she let him do it. That's an evidence, this is a, a, a crime evidence crossover. This is demonstrative evidence. Remember that evidence is admissible if it is relevant. And here it's relevant on the issue of identity, proper foundation. Well, this person uh, is going this is demonstrative evidence. The foundation for demonstrative evidence is simply that whatever the person is going to demonstrate is, you know, related, sufficiently related to some element of the crime and are not excluded. Well, there's no reason to exclude his voice. It's not hearsay. So he should be able to demonstrate his voice. Now, we all understand 
that when the person was robbing the bank, they could have made up an accident. And, uh, and the jury is not dumb. They know that too. But still, let them do it. The jury may not be convinced, but it's admissible, so you let them do it. He also moved to exclude some evidence of money found in the briefcase. Well, he would have excluded, tried to move it on the basis that we just talked about and his statement to the police officer. We've covered all that. Call of the question, line 26. How the cross of the court rule on today's motion regarding the following items. Item 1, reading the newspaper aloud. That's an evidence question. Let it in. 2, the currency that was discovered as a result of the, of the seizure of the arrest. Was it a lawful arrest? And was the discovery of the money incident to the lawful arrest? And we talked about that. Finally, Dave's statement to the police officer, same thing. You have the Miranda interrogation, but you have the public safety exception, and finally the shotgun itself. So we talked about all that. That's how that would be analyzed. When we come back from our break, uh, 10 minutes from now, we will talk about the question from the February 01 bar, which is the Deuce Cody question, and we'll start back at uh, uh, 15 minutes after. I'll give you an extra few minutes.